Welcome, everybody. My name is Jeff McGinnis. I'm the National Beverage Director for the Wine Styles family of stores. Um, happy New Year to everyone. We're off and rolling with another um, winery spotlight series. For those of you that have been with us for a long time, you know, obviously, we've been doing winery spotlight series across all of our stores, um, dating back a very, very long time. Um, and obviously, COVID kind of changed things, um, but they added some wonderful things to the way we go about doing um, some of our events. And this is one of those that was a, a, an added benefit because we wanted to still connect with everybody during COVID. Um, we still conduct, conduct, conducted our winery spotlight series, albeit in a hybrid method, but it allowed us to connect directly with the wineries across all of our stores simultaneously, much like we're doing tonight. A uh, couple friendly reminders before I introduce our guests and they start uh, sharing their wonderful wines uh, story and history with us. Um, we ask everybody stay muted. Um, if you have questions, comments, observations, we welcome those. Uh, we just ask that the stores place those in the uh, comment section. We will do our best to facilitate those um, as we go through the process. As always, all of our stores have the wines in their store for sale. So we appreciate your business, you know, as you go through and you find the ones that you love and like and want to, you know, put on your daily uh, daily or, or certainly weekly uh, drinking list, um, pick those up in your stores. We will continue to sock those and, and certainly promote the Brassfield uh, brand as we go along. Um, that is all I have to say. I'm going to introduce our special guest here because I know everybody is anxious to get that first uh, glass uh, glass of wine in their hands. We are lucky enough to have three wonderful guests with us from Brassfield um, Estates Winery. I will introduce them in order. I think, I'm not sure who's going to uh, take it from there. Um, but Rose, uh, Rose is our central region manager. Um, she's been obviously uh, one of the ones that's been helping us uh, really facilitate this tasting event. I think she came into the West Des Moines store a couple of months ago. Uh, we tasted through the wines with Matt and Brian there. Um, and we love the wines. We thought, hey, let's let's definitely do a feature with those. Uh, we also have Billy Iyer. He's the VP National Sales. Um, and then I think Jonathan Walters, he's going to probably be leading the show here. Um, he is the general manager for uh, Brassfield Estate Winery. He'll be talking about their family history, um, you know, the history of the winery, their philosophy, and certainly sharing the wines uh, with us as well. So with that, I will think maybe Rose is going to say something, then Billy, and then Jonathan. But either way, I'm looking forward to a great tasting event. Yeah, I will I will just kind of introduce Jonathan. So first I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. And these events are very special for us because um, as we go through the wines and you hear about the history of who we are, you know, we're a small winery. So events like this really give us exposure and um, we love for you to hear about us, learn about us and taste us. So these are fun events and um, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as we will enjoy doing it. So. I am excited that we have Billy on here. Um, he's in California as in San Jose, so he's not at the winery, but Jonathan is up at the winery. And Jonathan is, you know, a great one for us to have talk because he knows, he knows all about every vineyard, every vine and all the ins and outs. And Billy's great to have here because he has been with the winery since the beginning. So with that, I guess, um, Jonathan, you wanna go ahead and start talking? Yeah, uh, Billy, do you have anything to say before I take over? No, I just, to, to me, it's exciting. I started calling on wine styles many years ago uh, in the Bay Area and Southern California. So it's it's really encouraging for me to see the name still out there. And I remember the winery spotlights way back when. So it's uh, it's a great educational experience and, and great to touch a family, a state winery and learn a little bit about this from Jonathan. Yeah, uh, thanks, Billy. And I'll tell you a little bit of my history of wine styles. I, I went to Texas A&M, and I actually, when I, once I turned 21, I tried to find every opportunity I could to taste wine. And there was a wine styles that opened up, I think, last year I was there. And I think I was there almost every month trying to taste some wine and learn more about wine. So uh, it's kind of full circle. I'm glad to be back at wine styles, uh, uh, talking about the wine that I, we, I work very closely with and love, uh, being Brassville State Winery. Um, as you can see, we are a state winery. That is our beautiful uh, winery building that's uh, being uh, showed in the PowerPoint presentation in front of you. Um, we are in uh, uh, Northern California. Well, let's go here first. Thanks, Rose. <laughs> uh, no, you're good. Uh, so we were founded in 2000 by Jerry Brassfield. Uh, Jerry, uh, this uh, Jerry's bought this property back in the 70s as a cattle ranch from his good friend who was having some financial issues. He really bought it just to help his friend out and then just came to found, found to love the property 
And the story goes, he was coming up here one day and kept on seeing all the vineyards popping up. And he said, well, maybe this is something I need to do. So that process started in the late uh, 90s, 99, 2000. And eventually we got the first vow, uh, vines in the ground, uh, early 2000s, and first finches came in 2004. We are all estate grown. And what that means is all the wines are grown on this property. We know what happens from bud break to fruit set to when we pick it into pick the bin, pick the fruit and put it in the bins that brings it to our winery. Uh, we're about 40,000 cases and we control every facet of everything we do, which is uh, very uh, rare these days uh, to have a family owned and controlled uh, winery from step one all the way to bottle is pretty fantastic. Uh, we're in High Valley AVA. Uh, High Valley is on the North shore of Lake County. Uh, Lake County is in the North coast of California. The North coast consists of Napa, Sonoma, Lake County and Mendocino County. And we are the highest elevated of those four counties. Um, high elevation is something you hear me keep on talking as we go through this presentation. I'll circle back on that a little bit later. But what also makes us a little bit special is our ABA is what they call a transverse valley. It is a valley that goes east to west. There's very few of these in the world and it really makes our, our place very, very special. Um, a transverse valley goes east to west in our case, what it does, it allows us to cool off in the afternoon when it gets warm because the it pulls in the coastal breezes from the coast across our uh, valley and whips down our east to west valley as the way the wind travels and cools us off. Uh, if there's any questions, please, I'm good with questions. If anybody needs to interrupt me or type a question, please be all about that. Um, Okay, so Transverse Valley, I'll we'll circle back with that in the elevation once we get to the wines. Um, actually, let's, stop, let's just pause there. I hope everybody has a rosé in front of them maybe, and I hope everybody's enjoying that. Um, keep on sipping that, drinking that, and I'll keep on go talking about who we are for the time being. Um, we are 100% sustainable, both the winery and the vineyards. So we try to do my definition of sustainable. I think everybody has a different definition. And what my, our definition at Brassfield is, our goal is to have this property be a family winery venue for a long time to be. And the only way you're gonna be able to farm the same land for many years to come is to be very, very smart about that, okay? So we're very minimal in all of our applications. When we farm, we think about it very closely and we're trying to go for high quality fruit and we, you know, we cover crop, organic fertilizers, you know, we do all those things because we really care about our facility here. Uh, though we're not organic, and there's, we can talk more about that later, is organic is a very a weird definition and, you know, it doesn't really work all the time, being a high elevated um, vineyard. And for us, the sustainable, and we're doing all those organic practices, but we don't really want to pay for that organic certification because the sustainable is really what we're going for here. Um, like I said, there's about 5,000 acres on this property. We only have about 500 acres planted, so about 10%. So we have 90% of this land that's open for animals. We have massive wildlife corridors for the bear, the deer, the duck, the pheasants, whatever it is, mountain lions. We see those all the times across our property. Um, if you want to take a look at those, go to Instagram. Our Instagram, there's tons of pictures of our wildlife for you to check out there. Um, we have three different really grown regions inside our 5,000 uh, uh, acre property. We have a uh, volcanic, we actually own a volcano, Round Mountain Volcano, um, and the eruption that comes from that actually comes from a volcanic a volcano site. That's one region, one area that we have. Then we have our valley floor. That is a alluvial, well-drained, you know, from the gravity of all the erosion of the hillside from thousands of years that caused a well well-drained valley floor. And then we have our Franciscan side on the eastern side, which is where we tend to grow our Cabernet. And that is a more um, uplift, a sea a seabed uplift basically with a volcanic dusting because obviously this is a very volcanic region. So there's some volcanic undertones mixed into that Franciscan soil. Um, Carlos Valadez is our winemaker. Uh, Carlos has worked for us for about 15 years. Um, he started off as a cellar worker, worked his way to cellar master, and now he's our winemaker. We all love Carlos. 
he has experienced more than anybody through the, through through Brassfield. He's seen the early days. He's seen where we are now. He's seen the vineyards grow. He understands how to make the wines. He's we gone through many consultant winemakers like David Ramey, who's a good buddy who still buys print, uh, fruit from us, to David and Catherine DeSante, who consults with that are just fantastic folks that consult with some very high-end wineries that we can't talk about, but they are really making a change. Them and Carlos have really made the last couple of vintages a shining star, uh, really since Carlos has taken over the winemaking, since he really has known what the property does with his history here has really made a huge uh, change in our wines. And here's this map that kind of shows you where we are. See San Francisco in the distance. Um, you see Clear Lake, it is the largest natural lake in California. And I say that with an asterisk because half of Lake Tahoe mm -hmm. is in Nevada. Um, the, the lake tip to tip is about 28 miles long and we're about 28 miles from the coast. Uh, though, if you try to drive from Brasville to the coast, as you can ask Rose, is about a two and a half hour drive, and it's like driving a small intestine. It is a very windy road up and up and down a lot of hills. It's not very fun, uh, but we still get a lot of coastal influences. Um, before you change this slide, I want to talk about the elevation you see here. Um, we are much higher than Sonoma and Napa Valley. You know, Napa proper is at basically 30 feet elevation. And our valley floor is at 1,800 feet, and we go all the way up to 3,000 feet in elevation. Okay, so uh, yeah. Okay, next slide, Rose. You know what? Just to add, just to add to that, Jonathan, the lake is around 1,300 feet, right? Yes, correct. Thank you, Rose. That's good. So we're about 500 feet above the lake at the lowest point. All right. So here. Go, go ahead, Rose. I was going to say, so here we're talking about the valley floor and you have the rosé in your glass. That's so a great segue to talk about these vineyards. Yes, exactly. Uh, so rosé, so this is a Pinot Noir rosé. Um, we grow 17 different varietals. That's also something that's a little unique by us. We're not a winery that's just going to produce two or three wineries and call it good. Uh, when Jerry was doing his due diligence on this property, uh, UC Davis basically said we can grow whatever we wanted here. We can meet the climate range from Carneros all the way up to high elevation. We can grow Cabernet. So we do a little bit of everything. And when Jerry first planted, he did that. Um, and Pinot Noir was something that was near and dearest to his heart. And not to mention his brother grows Pinot Noir and he always wants to up, up in his brother and say he makes a better Pinot Noir. So he's very passionate about his Pinot Noir. And uh, this rosé is um, from Pinot Noir. Uh, it's a pick to press method. And what I mean by that is we pick and farm this fruit specifically for rosé. We pick it and we put it directly in the press and the color that we get is the color we get. And there's a lot of darker color rosés and that's called a signe method that they actually are picking their wine for Pinot Red Pinot Noir and they just open up the valve when they first get it and bleed the juice off. And they say, okay, what we bleed off is the Pinot Noir. And we believe we're making it in a true Provence style, this salmon color, uh, nice strawberry, raspberry, uh, raspberry. I get a little watermelon. You know, to me, this is a perfect uh, summer wine or uh, cocktail wine. This is the wine <laughs> we opened up in my house uh, before we open up something else. This is the one we kind of use to get, get going. And it, it's one that's near and dear to Rose because she, she has my name on it. after her. So, <laughs> but, you know, we tell her that, but I don't know if that's true or not. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions? No questions in the chat about Pinot Noir. Uh, Serenity. So we call this our Serenity. Um, uh, and we also have a Serenity Rosé, Serenity uh, uh, white wine, which would taste after the Sauvignon, uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris. Uh, Serenity, um, this is where Brassville sits. It's the High Serenity Ranch. So uh, we have a high, and we have High Serenity Pond. So we kind of brought that name into this very playful la uh, uh, label that's also a playoff or eruption label um, that you'll see a little bit later. Um, and I'll point that out at our next uh, Serenity White label to kind of uh, expand upon the story at that time. So uh, Pinot Gris, are we ready for the Pinot Gris? Sure, Pinot Gris, let me pour it. This is our staff favorite right now, uh, going through the winery. Um, this is a fantastic wine. Uh, to me, I was shocked uh, when I went through Chicago with Rose last year, how popular this wine was. And it was fantastic to actually see 
everybody enjoying this wine because it's always been a staff favorite. To me, this is uh, another cocktail wine, but to me, it's anything with shrimp or any seafood or the salad. I like to start this off with. Um, Pinot Gris is not something that's grown a lot in the north coast of California. Um, it's been kind of uprooted and there's more Sauvignon Blanc planted than Pinot Gris. And I think we do a fantastic job of this. Um, we picked this fruit at a lower brick. So it's being picked about 22 and a half uh, bricks. And bricks is a measurement of sugar that is in the grapes. So bricks is the potential alcohol is another way to look at that. So if you have 22 bricks, it's like 0.6. Uh, the bricks is the potential alcohol. And obviously that considers fruit flavors and all that other stuff. But we believe about that time, this fruit is really shining and we kind of developed a program a lot around that. Uh, Pinot Gris is a red grape. Not many people realize that. So we actually picked this grape as a red grape and it goes directly to the press. And the color we get is a white is a white wine, okay? So it's something that you have to be very careful with whenever you start bringing it to the winery because it can pick up some red color. So, but that's, you know, we don't have that trouble because it's a state winery and everything is done internally. Rose? John, Jonathan, why is, it a, why is it a Pinot Gris and not a Pinot Grigio? Yeah, uh, so Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio, it's, it's the same grape, it's interchangeable names. Uh, Pinot Grigio is typically a, uh, from, Italy or the Italians call it Pinot Grigio and, it, and the French or the Alsatians call it Pinot Gris. And typically nowadays it's two different styles of wine is what it ends up being. Pinot Gris are usually a softer, a little bit more fruitier, uh, a little bit more uh, acidic driven wine. And same with Pinot Grigio, it's acidity, but it's a little bit more stone fruit in Pinot Grigio. I, I far pre prefer the Alsatian style Pinot Gris than the Italian Pinot Grigios. And not to mention, I think it sounds a lot better too. So, um, you know, that, not, that's the reason we changed it, but I felt we felt that Pinot Gris style does better for us up here. I think too, a difference too with our Pinot Gris versus Pinot Grigio is, you know, a lot of Italian Pinot Grigios are like um, really clean, crisp, fruit forward, and then they dissipate where our Pinot Gris has a lot more roundness in the mouthfeel right. and it has a much longer finish, which makes it a much more food friendly wine. So hopefully you guys are getting that, you know, as you're tasting it. But when I say a rounder mouthfeel, it kind of almost coats your whole mouth so that it does even like that acidity makes you pucker, makes your mouth water. And that's always what makes your food even taste, you know, more desirable. And it, it's a great pairing. It's a great pairing for any kind of seafood. Um, I, even like fried foods, like if you had fried calamari, oh, yeah. fried chicken, anything like that, it's, it really holds up to that and, and lets it shine. Even yeah, Thanksgiving I, too. Yeah. Turkey, great turkey wine. Yeah, I, I, Billy's right. And I, I would agree, uh, you know, fried foods, it's a fantastic. <laughs> if you don't know what to serve for Thanksgiving, it's Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris because it goes with everything, right? You can hit every base with those two wines. To me, this Pinot Gris makes me salivate almost. It makes me, has a umami type thing going on that, I want some food with it and it's very, very, just extremely enjoyable wine. And it's not a very, it's not a wine you find all over the place. Um, it's a unique wine that is, I, I really enjoy. Okay, are you being impacted by the core weather? Uh, yeah, you know, I figured this question was gonna come at some point today. So uh, we have got about seven and a half inches of rain in the last, I know it feels like it's been raining for a month now, but it's only been about a week. Uh, uh, just to put it in, in perspective that Clear Lake that I mentioned is the largest lake in California. It has risen two and a half feet in the last two weeks. Okay. That is a monstrous lake. So I mentioned 28 miles long. It is a huge lake and a lot of water get, is going into that. Um, luckily, you know, the good thing with all this rain is it's been very dry out here. We haven't had a lot of rain the last couple of years. A lot of this water is growing into the ground. A lot of the hillsides, um, the water is not even making it down the hillside. It's still going into the ground, the hillsides. Uh, I went through, I was going through Hillsburg the other day, and the Russian River possibly was the largest. I've never seen the Russian River so, lar uh, so large. It was just flowing. It was just going as fast as it can. Um, <laughs> the water has been a big issue. And I know uh, Billy has been, he, Billy's lost power multiple times and lost the fence and all that other stuff. So, yeah, I mean, the weather's you know, California, you get extremes, you get mudslides, you get rain, you get flooding. I mean, we a fire, we get every extreme of everything. When it rains here, it doesn't sprinkle, it goes full bore. 
So yeah, thanks for the question. But uh, I think up at the winery, we're doing okay. Uh, but I think the cities are having far more issues than we are at this current time. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc is what Lake County is kind of known for in terms of white wines. Um, it is uh, becoming, Lake County is becoming the Sauvignon Blanc capital of California. And I will go and, and say, I'll put up against uh, New Zealand and Sincere and all those places. It is becoming a place that other wineries want to come to Lake County and make create a Sauvignon Blanc program. But the problem is, is a lot of these North Coast Sauvignon Blancs that you're drinking from, if it's Hess or, or in all these other wineries, it is actually probably mostly Lake County fruit, but they don't want to market it that way because uh, they don't want, they don't, they don't want the price of the fruit to get any higher than what it is, right? Because uh, it is a fantastic wine. Um, it's probably the highest demand grape that we have outside of Cabernet and in terms of selling the fruit. And our Sauvignon Blanc has won a uh, double gold in the last two years, back-to-back -back years. And it's been scoring 97, 98 by some, uh, some reviewer, reviewers. It is a probably gonna be a favorite wine of the night. Um, I'm gonna stop talking and pour it because I wanna drink it. Uh, I think, you know, I, I always like to say that we're um, <clears throat> a little bit of a, we're a California winery with a little bit of an old world flair. And I think a great expression of this is not only the Pinot Gris, the Rosé and the Pinot Gris that we had, but the Sauvignon Blanc, because it doesn't, it doesn't have that really grassy and acidic like New Zealand. And it doesn't have like your typical California Sauvignon Blancs that could be a lot more grapefruit. This right. almost, this almost tries to mimic a little bit more towards a Sancerre. Um, where it finishes nice and soft and again has that more balance and when it finishes more soft instead of that really acidic and grassiness it, it makes it again more food friendly <laughs> yeah oh man uh to me i love sitting outside and this is the wine when i'm outside on my deck this is the wine i'm drinking uh if it's just with cheese and crackers or just you know, on a saturday afternoon this is the wine i'm reaching for when i'm in a swimming pool or outside, this is the wine I'm going for. Uh, it's easy drinking wine, it's not complicated. And I do think you get a lot of Sancerre characteristics without actually paying the Sancerre prices. I actually, I, I bought one during Thanksgiving because it's been a while since I've had one, it was $40. And not, nothing, I love Sancerre and nothing gets Sancerre, but I think we're providing an amazing, amazing deal and price point for this. Uh, 100% is state wine too, and also. So, um, anything to add there, Billy Rose? It's actually Billy's favorite wine. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll let him, I'll allow him to speak at this point. Uh, actually, I, I opened this Sunday night. Yeah. And this wine is absolutely still fantastic. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think, I think one that's of the things that you get, thing. go ahead, Rose, sorry. You know, I was going to say that's a common thing with all the wines, and that I think is due to the high elevation and the, and the um, well-balanced acidity that we have in them. Yeah, you know, we have a lot of natural acidity. We're in our winemaking process. We're not trying, we're making picking decisions around the acidity, not only the, the flavor profile, because acidity is really key to the quality of making wine. Um, so we, we might make a couple picks knowing we need an acidic pick because it actually brings the balance of the wine. You know, the way, the, I wish I had a chart to drive, but if you kind of think of it, you know, alcohol is always going to stay the same, right? And you have tannin that, you know, eventually de degrades, right? And acidity always stays the same. And when all three of those intersect, you're kind of making the perfect wine. And that's what we're trying to do is get everything to be perfectly balanced whenever we uh, are making these wines so they can age a long time. The, the tannin, you know, all the health benefits are increased at high elevation. And I think those things of causing these wines to stay in the bottle longer and also after you open up, open them up. Um, I'm kind of surprised to hear that wine didn't made it this three days with Billy. You know, he must've been really busy with that, the, that down fence. So, you know. And so I thought something that you said, does that mean our wines are healthier? <laughs> Technically, uh, we are running tests on that. The answer is yes. The wines that high elevation have been proven to be healthier. The, uh, uh, the resveratrol, um, I've done some studies with some Napa and Sonoma wines that I've taken grape samples 
and run uh, uh, tannin numbers and resveratrol and all those things. And our, we are higher in, in those categories in those counties. Uh, and it's because of the elevation and because of the heat we have here, uh, we get thicker skins, okay? And those thicker skins is where all the healthy, all the good stuff is on, in the wine. And as we said with that, uh, uh, that you don't, color in wine comes from the skins. That's why the skins have to stay in the tank with the juice, okay? So that, the longer you have those skins in there, the healthier they are, the thicker they are, there's more of those nutrients. And those are all things we have to do up here, um, which makes just, you know, again, 100% of state, high elevation, healthier wines. I feel like, you know, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but it's to the point. And um, I'm talking about elevation. I'm trying not to talk about the elevation too much until we get the red wines. But, you know, I keep on, I keep on going there. It's just where we so, are. Right, I guess so. Yes. Um, questions with Savio Blanc? I don't want to, I don't want to pour this one out. So I'm going to finish it. Yeah. So I think what we'll do, Jonathan, is once we get done with the Serenity White, we can kind of, I, I can't see all the chats, maybe because I'm sharing my screen, but there's, looks like there's some questions. So after we finish with the Serenity White, maybe we can take a pause and kind of answer some questions before we move into the reds. Uh, mostly the questions are Julie, uh, pointing out what wine we're on. The only question we have so far is about the weather. Oh, okay. okay. Yep. Usually the more people drink, the more questions they have. So <laughs> I, 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 I assume more is, are coming down the way. Okay. Drink up, people. We need questions. <laughs> and I apologize if I'm going too fast. That's just my nature. If you need me to slow down, just let me know. Um, we'll go uh, ahead and go on. to... Hold on, Jonathan, a second. Yes, the reason Jonathan's going fast is he's excited. This is Jonathan. <laughs> it's, uh, he's very passionate about what he's doing and he wants to really create this excitement behind it. So I can tell he's excited right now. Let's go. Let's do this, you know. All right. All right. Serenity Whites, I'll hold this up. So we talked about uh, Serenity being the lake. So this label, that blue little circle is High Serenity Lake. That's kind of what I envisioned here. That was our representation of the Serenity White in, in connected to the property being Lake Serenity, okay? And as we get to the eruption, we, like I said, we own Round Mountain Volcano and that triangle is our volcano, okay? So we're kind of being a little playful with our what we own and what we're trying to get a, a point across here. So when we did the Serenity White, I mean the Serenity uh, Rosé, we felt that uh, doing that little playful la label was a good thing because the rosé market is a very competitive market and we wanted to stand out a little bit. So that's kind of the reason why we did that. Um, our Serenity White is a blend of uh, three grapes. Um, Gewürztraminer um, is in this along with our Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris. Gewürztraminer means spice, okay? So to me, anything that has Gewürztraminer in it, you know, Get out the sauerkraut, get out the kielbasa, get out the sausages. And this type of wine with a sauvignon blanc and pinot gris, slightly sweet, goes with that perfectly, okay? Um, I call this Lake County's uh, perfect wine because you go out on the lake here, bring a couple bottles of, of uh, Serenity White, and it's a perfect lake day wine. It's a simple wine. It's easy to drink. It's a crowd pleaser. And... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's actually like if you were to say, you know, I'm going to someone's house and I don't really know what they drink, Serenity White's a perfect one because it, it could appease those that like Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, even an on oak Chardonnay. Um, you know, it's, it kind of um, appeases those who want something a little bit sweet, but not offend those who don't like sweet. It's kind of right there in the middle with the fruit. And it's a perfect wine for spicy foods, again, fried foods or anything like that. Um, We've done some wine dinners and this wine always kind of is the one the chefs love to play with because it can, we can use it for dessert. We can use it at the beginning of the meal. Um, you know, you can do it with so many different foods. So it is a fun one. And, you know, we talk about the name Serenity and I have, have to always say like, who doesn't need Serenity in their lives right now? <laughs> yeah. And uh, to me, my, I love, I love Thai food. This is the perfect um, Thai wine. If it's curry or whatever it is this is the one that i'm just i i, I want to have here yeah what's the percentage of each grape in the serenity um it is mostly sauvignon blanc it's about 60 percent sauvignon blanc 
uh, 30% uh, Pinot Gris, about 10% Gewürztraminer. Now, every year that changes ever so slightly by a couple of percentage points, but that is the, the gist of it of every year. Um, so I might be a couple percentage points off every vintage of that, but that's basically the gist of it. Um, I think you get the, uh, this, the Gewürztraminer is the sweet component in this wine. Uh, we, and Gewürztraminer, if you ever had an opportunity, I don't know if anybody's actually had, it had object to eat wine grapes before. They're about half the size of normal grapes. Some, some are even smaller and they're really, really sweet, okay? This reverse amino, we've, uh, we've played around with it a lot last couple of years to try to find the perfect time to pick this. And one year we let it hang out there a little bit longer and it was the craziest thing. It tasted like fruity pebbles. I felt like I was back in, you know, back, back as a kid at my breakfast table going to school. It, it tasted all those crazy fruity flavors. Um, Gewürztraminer me is a very cool grape. Um, when it's, it talked about, it, somebody wanted to know the lake's impact on making wine in Lake County. And that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Clear Lake, there is a lake effect that happens inside uh, uh, Lake County because of the lake, uh, especially at, where I live, I live in Big Valley, is uh, and where a lot of Sauvignon Blanc is grown. We're at, we're at, Brassville has the lake effect, and the big lake effect up at Brassville is is the, you know the lake kind of tunnel uh, pulls in the the way it's shaped. It, the wind goes down to the lake, and then it kind of pushes the lake up to us. But on the valley floor where Clear Lake is, uh, there's a huge uh, change in uh, the weather because of that, the wind that's kind of generated by the lake. But not only that, but also uh, the humidity that comes off the lake is good and bad. Um, it's, it's good in the, early, in the early season because it's less frost days and we're not worried about our crop freezing. And the end of the year, uh, there's a threat of uh, rot and stuff, but the lake usually doesn't, Lake County is so high in elevation that the humidity tends to dry off and there's not a lot of humidity in the summer. It tends to be here in the spring, but not the summer, which is really nice when growing the grapes. Hey, Jonathan. Um, yes, sir. You talk a little bit about kind of the lake as an air conditioner for High Valley and the cool region two on the valley floor where all these whites came from. Yeah, um, there we go. Thanks, Rose. You know where I was going with that. So um, you can see here that you see the, um, Let's start on the left of this picture. The Central Valley where it says Yolo County, heat rises. So when the heat rises in the Central Valley of California, when it rises, it actually pulls the air from the coast across the North Coast of California, okay? So the coastal influence goes across Mendocino and then comes to us as these lines kind of show right here. And when it does that, it kind of funnels into this little peninsula right here. That's actually when Mount Kanaktai is another volcano. And when Mount Kanaktai blew, it actually made this little peninsula. So when that peninsula got made, the wind cannot go around Kanaktai and it gets forced, it hits that peninsula and actually goes up into High Valley. And it goes into High Valley, it's like an air conditioner at two o'clock. The wind like doubles like that because the Central Valley, the heat's rising, it's pulling this air across um, the coastal region. And a lot of that air is very high up. So, you know, Sonoma and Lake, I mean, Sonoma and Napa get it, but not to a large degree, but we're getting the brunt of it because we're at this high elevation and it cools us off. So we're at much cooler uh, in the afternoons. We don't get these really, really hot days like Napa and Sonoma. When Napa and Sonoma, get these extreme heat days when they when you read that oh it's 110 degrees in California if you check the weather in Lake County or even specifically at Brassville we are probably 10 degrees cooler than everybody else because of this air that ends up being pushed across uh, Northern California that cools us off and that is a big component of uh, like it, the AC turns on at two o'clock in the afternoon and you can put a timer to it it's kind of nuts All right, before we go into the reds, is there any other questions <clears throat> about any of the whites or anything that we've already talked about? Um, the blend. So somebody was asking, is, I assume this might be a proprietary blend, so it might be one of those questions you cannot answer. But in general generalities, um, maybe the majority of the percentages are X, Y, Z or whatnot. 
Yeah, it's it's roughly 60% Sauvignon Blanc, 30% Pinot Gris, and 10% Gewurz demeanor, plus or minus. Now, does that change every year because you're looking for a specific flavor profile? Is it more of a recipe that you follow? And no, I mean we we take every vintage as what it gives us, right? So if we feel one year that the we kind of have this little window that we want the wine to be in, and some years it might be a little to the right, some years it might be a little to the left, but we're trying to stay in this pretty small window. So some years it might be a little bit more Gewurz or a little bit more Pinot Gris. But, you know, we kind of have this style we're going for and the way it really, the way you ferment the wine and the temperature that's fermented, if you ferment something hot, you get a lot of color, but you lose a lot of aromatics and fruit flavors. And if you ferment something cold, you get a lot of aromatics, you don't get a lot of color. So there's a give and take. So basically when we start the fermentation, we have an idea of what we want to get from it. And unless something goes sideways and we typically don't have those issues we've had i don't know last four years there hasn't been any of those type of issues um you know it's kind of nice being a a state winery there's a lot of natural yeast out in the vineyard so by now a lot of those natural yeasts are already in the winery there's already a population of those so there's not like something wacky is going to be happening um and when we try to ferment something so Jonathan, I can go back and somehow I can remember, but the most amount of Gewurz that ever went into this wine was 14% yeah. and as little as 6%. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think Billy, you're pretty well close to that. I think we're on the smaller side of that percentage. I would say five to 10%. I don't think, I don't think we're going to go back to the 14% days. No, um, I think, I think 10% is high because it's, and it just depends on the year. I mean, some years, this year is great at 10%, but when you start right. getting, I, I think everybody can attest with that wine, a little bit of Gewurz goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah, and yes. we don't we don't have a lot, right? I mean, first of all, we don't make a ton of this wine. You know, the amount of cases is small and the amount of Gewurz we even have vineyards of, I'm assuming is one of our smaller. Yeah, no, we, we made the decision a couple of years back. We had uh, a lot more diverse demeanor and we, we made the decision that we needed more Viognier because we liked the way the Viognier worked with Syrah and some other components that we do in eruption and what it brings. So we T-butted some of that diverse demeanor over to um, uh, Viognier. And T-butting is, if no one knows what that is, it's if you already have an established vine, of, like we said, reverse demeanor, you could actually cut the vine off, put in a bud of, in this case, it's Vignet, you actually do a little, make a little tea, fill back the bark, put the bud in, and wrap it in, and now you have Vignet there. So we made that conscious decision to actually make a change to move to Vignet, and uh, I, I think we've all been very happy with that. Yeah. Yeah, big wineries in Lake County. Yeah, I, I would say that um, most of the fruits that is grown in Lake County ends up in Napa County. And I tell you, all those CFOs, I know that, you know, they love the fact that Lake County is planting more grapes because it's making their product better and then they're paying the fraction of the prices um, up here because Napa is just so crazy expensive. Um, you know, they are still trying to buy a lot of Lake County fruit and they still, you know, they probably will for a long time. Um, but the problem is a lot of these big wineries don't want to come into Lake County to build something up here because it's it's hard to get to. Um, there is three roads into this county, three roads out to the county, but and there's 11 stoplights in the whole county, okay? So, which is one of the reasons I love being up here. Uh, I hope that some of these wineries do start labeling Lake County more because the wine is justified. The, the wine's great, the fruit is great. Um, you know, I've talked to, you know, Kendall Jackson, believe it or not, actually started in Lake County. You know, their original facility was Lake County, and they called that California for a long time with all their first vintages that Jed still made. It was all Lake County fruit, and um, they decided to move down to Santa Rosa, and if you've been to that facility, it is right on 101, and millions of people drive past it all the time. So that's kind of the big reason why there's not more wineries up here. You know, and, you know, part of me wants more big wineries up there, and the other half is like, you know what, it's more, it's more, more for the taking for us because we're growing and I think we have the wine that's good enough to be able to represent Lake County at a high level. So, 
All right, we'll go to Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is a variety that you won't find much in Lake County because <clears throat> there's not a lot of uh, premier spots to grow it. And I think we probably have nearly all of them. Um, it is, we're kind of have this up on a bench. So this is a, a bench as a well-drained soil that's off the valley floor. Um, it's kind of, and it's in a little pocket where the hills above it, there's a little um, drop in the hill. And that wind I was talking about actually goes down in that hill and cools it off in the afternoon. And this vineyard is actually planted at the perfect row orientation to minimize the solar the amount of sun on the fruit during harvest, okay? Pinot Noir is a very thin skin grape and it's very easy to burn it or mess it up at the last moment whenever you're ready to pick it. So it is the, it is the baby of the group and in terms of you have to kind of be very careful. One reason why Pinot Noir is expensive is it's hard to grow and it's hard to make and it's hard to do right. And I'm very proud of our Pinot Noir. Uh, the last couple of vintages have been fantastic. Um, I believe we're receiving really good scores on this now. And, um, you know, our winemaker is very passionate about Pinot Noir. Um, he actually made a reserve Pinot Noir. Well, he made a high-end Pinot Noir uh, as a little just a little project one year. And it was so good. We decided to bottle it. And it's really changing a lot of uh, what people think of Pinot Noir in Lake County. Uh, we had a couple of uh, well-known master psalms that have had it recently. And they're like, you could put this in a lineup of Russian River Pinot and you wouldn't know the difference. Um, and that's a pretty high praise. And I take, that's, I'm very proud of that. Uh, this is my wife's favorite wine. So I get to drink it a lot because she gets home before I do. So she's the one that's opening the wines. So I drink this a lot. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great wine. Um, it's one that Rose is passionate about. Um, when I first started farming here in Lake County and up at Brassfield, I was very worried about the Pinot Noir and how if we could actually make it at a high level like this. And Rose throws that in my face because I said that to her. And every time she gets it, I think we're doing it at a high level and I think we can continue to do it. It just took a couple of years to figure out. Yeah. Now, does this see all French oak? Uh, this, you know, so we, we use French, <laughs> American and Hungarian at the winery here. We use a little bit of all the all the flavors. Um, you know, this one gets French oak. Pinot loves French oak, so this one does get. We actually have some open top, which is some big oak barrels uh, that we do punch downs, and that's a French oak barrel. Uh, so the, yeah, so this does see some French oak treatment. And I think too, a thing to note is a lot of Pinot Noirs coming out of California, especially at this price point, are never a hundred percent. Pinot Noir. Uh, yeah, you know, I'll say it, you know, Miomi is not Pinot Noir. I know that's what the world thinks what Pinot Noir should taste like. Um, I know there's a lot of Syrah that gets back blended and a lot of Pinot Noir because uh, Pinot is very, very difficult to get color out of. And that's the big, biggest issue with Pinot Noir. It's hard to get good color. Um, and so Syrah tends to end up in Pinot Noir very, very often. Ours is 100% Pinot Noir. Um, it is like I like I mentioned when we first started. It is a something our owner wants to do very well because he wants to open in front of his brother and say I did it better than you. And his brother has a winery in Santa Cruz uh, Mountains, so it's it, it's it's a very proudful thing for us to make a very good Pinot Noir. So we do our best to 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 do that. All right, Billy. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. This is if if you guys get the chance to meet Rose and see her drive up in her car, her license plate has says Pinot Noir on it. Okay, so I do like Pinot Noir. So I happen to really like ours. Um, I think the other reason that I like Pinot Noir is it's very delicate. Yeah. And and when you do it right, it's very beautiful. And I think this again, we go going back to like when I said we have that old world style. This is definitely done more of that Burgundian style to what true traditional Pinot Noir should and does taste like. <clears throat> All right. All right. Let's, I think we got 15, <laughs> 20 minutes left. So I'll, so elevation. Now I've been wanting to say this all the whole time. Uh, this picture is actually from our volcano uh, Ridge Vineyard. Um, 
And so this is where, the, that's where eruption comes from. But I believe the Cabernet is their next wine. So not to confuse you, but that, that hill off in the distance in this picture, that's Mount Kanaktai. That is not a dormant volcano. That's still as considered an active volcano. Um, our round mountain volcano is still considered an active volcano. Lake County is home to the geysers. It's the largest geothermal field in, uh, I believe, the, uh, well, at least California, and, and it powers nearly most of Santa Rosa and San Francisco. So <clears throat> there's a lot of geo activity still up in, uh, in Lake County. Um, our Cabernet, which is our next line, oh, the, my favorite stat that I say all the time, okay? So 1% of all vineyards in the world, 1% of all vineyards in the world are above a thousand feet in elevation, okay? Nearly all uh, brass field is over 2000 feet. Now our valley field floor is at 18. Nearly all of our red wine is over 2000 feet. So you, you can assume that we're probably 1% of 1% of where this wine's being grown in terms of elevation. Uh, so, 1% of all vineyards in the world is over 1,000 feet, and we're all above, all red is nearly above 2,000 feet in elevation. And on top of that, we're 100% estate and family owned. I don't think you'll find uh, many vineyards that are at elevation like we are, have the quality of fruit that we do, and that is owned by a family owned group. So uh, the elevation is a huge uh, part of that. And, and every 1,000 feet in elevation that you gain, it's like gaining 10, 10 degrees in latitude, okay? So we're basically uh, up at Oregon in that sense, which is the same parallel as Bordeaux, okay? So we have this short, intense growing season because we're at elevation with the UV and with our weather, weather pattern, we're actually spraying a lot less because our growing season is about four weeks shorter than Napa, okay? So just right there, we're a lot, you know, there's a lot more, act we're not going up and down the vineyard all the time, trying to make it perfect. Part of my growing philosophy is the more you touch the vine, you're more, more with, you're interfering more with what it wants to do. If you let the vine do what it wants to do, it's going to be happy because that's what it wants to do. We're just there to remove any excess growth on the bottom of the vine and to make sure it's producing a safe, uh, uh, quantity for our quality wines, okay? And I think this Cabernet at the price point of this, now I'm not gonna say the price point, I'll let Rose say, cause I'm probably gonna say it wrong. Well, we have a couple of different states here, so. Okay, all right. Well, it's a credible deal uh, at the price point. This, I don't think you can find another Cabernet that's this good at this price point. Um, you know, there was a meeting I was in recently and they actually did a blind tasting of, uh, this, our Cabernet, it was a two other very well-known $80 Cabernets. And this group did a blind. And these are people in the wine industry. And they all chose our wine as the most expensive and best wine. And then they opened up the blind and they were shocked to find out that it was a Lake County wine and it wasn't the two Napa wines, okay? And I will also tell you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, very high-end wineries in Napa that are blending this fruit into hundred dollar bottles of wine. And they're saying, your wine's making my wine a lot better, which just tears me to pieces when they say that, because, you know, they're getting the press, they have the marketing power behind them, <clears throat> but you know, we make a fantastic Cabernet. And I believe this is the sec second vintage of this, third vintage of this, second vintage. Okay. So this is still new to us. We're still growing this program. And I'm very, very happy to have this in our in our book going forward. This is this is the third vintage, Jonathan. Third vintage, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I think you touched on too how we we are farmers, farmers first and foremost. So we do sell a lot of our grapes to our friends down below. And that is part of the reason that our prices are so affordable as we're growing and getting that momentum going. Oh man, I, I can't, I mean. That's, I just said, wow. I mean, it's, it's it, I mean, it's, it, I mean, I drink this wine all the time and I'm still, I still get blown away that we can do this at, you know, it's, it's just a great wine. I'm just not saying that folks. I, you know, you don't, probably don't believe me, but this, <laughs> I really do. I really do think this wine's great. It's too bad we can't see everybody. We could have them all raise their hands if they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Oh, here's some pictures. Okay, pictures. So one thing we did in the last couple of years, the biggest project I've been taking off was we actually added a uh, new Cabernet vineyard. Uh, and when we did this, we went across, we, we decided that we were going to put make the best Cabernet vineyard in Northern California. So when we started this project, um, we hired an a, a irrigation contractor and we wanted to be the way I farm is precision farming, all right? Um, all of our irrigation is done on my phone here. I can turn it on, I can turn it off. I can see the water levels in the ground. I can see, I can turn on everything from my phone and, it's, and it gets a true irrigation. If one block, and there's uh, more stress in one block, I can irrigate just that one block. I can irrigate it at nighttime. So there's less evaporation. So the vines are actually getting a true amount of water every time we do it. It is a precision farming and that's how you make high end grapes, okay? This picture on the left was, uh, that's looking at Mount Kanakdai, that volcano I mentioned from the other um, uh, uh, photo. This picture is three year old vines. Uh, the root structure of these vines are already probably five feet deep, which is amazing. And what's gonna end up happening is we're gonna have to, we're gonna get to irrigate less as these vines get old, because this root structure is gonna be so far in the ground, um, it's gonna be able to be able to drink, drink by itself. And the reason why I know that is, is because I dug up some vines and measured it. Um, the picture on the right is looking back to where the first picture was taken. And this was at the same time these pictures were taken. The one on the right was that we were about to plant this vineyard. Um, and all the clones of Cabernet are all French clones through here. We believe the French clones are um, superior in our, for, for where we are in our growing region. Uh, a lot of old California is all the American clones. Uh, I see a picture, is that irrigation uh, technology common? No, not at all. Um, it's, we're probably one of the first to do it on a large scale like this. Um, it's very common in, you know, in uh, landscaping and in greenhouses, but this is very new to large scale ag. Um, and we actually have a controller and I have a control that I program that turns on the engine by itself, turns off the engine, engine by itself. Uh, we're trying to be very smart with our labor as it's, as it gets more and more expensive. Uh, to farm. I don't know what it is where you guys are, but uh, minimum wage out here is now fifteen fifty an hour. And four years ago, it was ten dollars an hour. So it's gone up over thirty uh, percent recently, and that's that's hard when our crop prices are not continually rising. So we're trying to use as much technology as we can in the vineyard, and this irrigation line has proven to be uh, well worth its uh, its money spent. Um, the picture on your left is when we first ripped the vineyard. And by ripping, I mean, we took out all the roots because there was trees in this location and we purged all the roots. And we, all those, you see those little white marks closest to the picture? Those are all straws. So we actually put straws out. So that's where we know where we're gonna put a vine and a stake, okay? So that photo was done and I think probably August, because you can see we're uh, yellow, we're putting out straw, getting wet, ready for winter. And then the next year, uh, there was the picture on the right, you can see the stakes are out, those white cartons have vines in them and it snowed. So this picture I believe was, um, that was probably February uh, when, that, when that snow came in. And snow has been a yearly occurrence the last four years up here. Uh, so it, it is, we do get snow on a regular basis but not like you folks in Chicago. Uh, you or probably don't call that snow. Yeah, uh, but I always gotten more than Chicago. <laughs> um, also kind of touch on how red the soil is there. Yeah, um, so you see that soil is a volcanic soil. Um, just on the other side of the lake is where Mount, Mount Kanaktai is. Uh, this soil is very deep and very volcanic. Uh, when we put it in this vineyard, I actually got on the back of a backhoe or in an excavator and tried to dig down to the bottom of the volcanics so I can see how deep the soil was. And I couldn't find the bottom of the volcanics, which to me means I can irrigate the whole, that whole block the same, that there's not a lot of changes uh, in the soil because everything is very consistent, which makes farming a lot easier to do. I got a question uh, about the Cabernet, how much Malbec is in that. Um, again, it differs every year. 
uh, it goes from five to 10%, uh, but it's always going to be 9% Cabernet. Uh, going forward, it's probably going to maybe even creep up to be more Cabernet, but I would think we'll always put about 5% Malbec in there. We believe that Malbec really rounds it out and makes it soft. Uh, this is a what we consider a BTG uh, program. It's where you can buy the bottle or at a restaurant, you can buy it by the glass. So when we open it, we, we want it to be consumed and with now a lot of harsh tannins, it can be aged, but we want it to be uh, easy to drink right away. And that's why we add that mall back to it. Um, this picture uh, is at our Syrah vineyard. Uh, we call this vineyard perspective. It is meter by meter space Syrah and Vignet. And if everybody's been to Coroti or know what Coroti is, it's a region in France what's known for Syrah and Vignet. And this is the style of wine, how they plant that wine. So this is kind of an homage to what, how they farm and grow stuff over there. Um, it's probably, it's some, some fantastic Syrah and Vignet. Uh, fortunately, it's not, uh, it's a taste room only wine uh, where this vineyard, this, where this vineyard is. But if you ever come out here, we'll definitely pour you a, a taste of that. Um, but like I said, elevation is very special. It makes us very 1% and 1% probably in terms of where the, the fruit is being grown. And our last one being eruption. Eruption has been our powerhouse for a long time. Um, it is a red blend. Uh, Malbec and straw are the leaders in this blend. Uh, traditionally, it's always going to be Malbec, but you know, some years it, it gets close. 40% um, Malbec, 30% Syrah, but in any given time, this wine is 70%, the two of those. Uh, the other, other varietals in this wine is Petit Syrah, Grenache, Zinfandel, Morvedra is in this wine. Um, so it's, if it, uh, when, yeah, and that's, Morvedra is the one that we're missing uh, in, on that list, but it's usually a proprietary blend. It changes all the time. So I'm not going to be able to give you the percentages of this one, but Malbec and Syrah are always the two leaders, and those two make up about 70%. Um, this is a, I mean, I'm, I'm originally from Texas. As I mentioned, I went to Texas A&M. When I bust out my smoker or get my grill going, I'm pouring the eruption. That is the wine for grilling. If it's a hamburger or anything like that, it is it's the wine, and even... Uh, my wife has been pulling it out when we do pasta, like a bolognese, it works up with that pretty well. So that's kind of what I, prefer, how I drink this. And this is a, um, it's a, just a fabulous one. I, I know I keep on saying everything's fabulous, but you know, it, it, it is a, it's a crowd pleaser. This is the wine I bring. If I go to a, uh, uh, someone's house, that I don't know them very well, or to our party, I don't know who's going to be there. I bring a eruption and it's going to please everybody. Yeah, it's definitely the meat, the meat lover's wine, you know, pizza <laughs> meat, but I will say dark chocolate with it is very good too. But it's yeah. a gold lush, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll talk a little bit to the percentages, if that's okay, okay Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this definitely is a proprietary wine and our owner is very protective of the percentages, but I'll give you really the base foundation of this. You're looking at Syrah and Malbec and really the lead is Malbec. So about 56% Malbec. And I think it's about 19% Syrah. And then you can do the guesswork on the back end, but really looking at this wine, that base foundation will always be Malbec and Syrah. Questions? Uh, question. I always have a nice question is obviously now that the world is somewhat out of the reach of COVID, but there is uh, <laughs> circling back. Um, you know, tell tell us about you know coming to see you visits, wine tastings, winery tour tours, all those fun things. Yeah, absolutely. So we we do have a, a taste room on our property. We're at Clear Coast, North Shore of uh, Lake County. Um, the, our taste room is open seven days a week. Uh, Marlena is her name. She runs our taste room. Uh, you know, I'm sure if you go in there and mention you were at this event, she will, she will definitely, uh, maybe she might be motivated to comp your tasting. If not, just say my name and I'll come around rolling over. Um, yeah, I know we do offer, uh, uh, different flights of tasting. We have a gorgeous patio and outdoor sitting area, uh, with, you know, cornhole and some uh, yard games over there. 
Uh, so that you know, it's a wonderful place to come enjoy uh, some wine. Lake County is really a stunning place to come in California. It's different from Napa and Sonoma. Like I said, there's not a whole bunch of fine dining restaurants. It's it, there's some good restaurants here. It's it's low key. It's relaxing. You can have a great day on the lake. Um, let's see uh, the property. I I love I love October and spring out here. It's just it's stunning in spring. Everything's still green. October, it's harvest. You can see some action happening on the crush pad and it's not, you know, and it's cooling down. You got some colors in the vineyard. Um, so that's great. We do make a, a number of taste room only wines. Um, I'll tease you when we make a hundred percent Malbec, that Prospective Syrah, we have a hot, very high end Cabernet that is scoring fantastic. We have a Petit Verdot that's about 94 points. That's been well, uh, well received. Uh, and we have a picture of Carlos here. Carlos is a winemaker and also, uh, and that's in front of our caves. Uh, right now we're not doing any cave tours, but uh, we do have cave tours uh, on occasion. And then also we do vineyard tours on occasion also. So we do offer those things. And here's uh, Carlos. Carlos is my uh, vineyard manager. He's my right hand in the vineyard. He makes everything happen um, because in my role, I was, I still am, I guess, a director of farming. But as my role as GM, I'm being sucked into the office more. And Carlos is really running the uh, running the show out there. You can see a picture of a vine. This is a one-year-old vine. I mean, you can see there that root structure is probably you know two or three feet big already, and that's only on a one-year-old vine. Um, I have a question here. Is it 56 percent of six uh, Malbec, um, Billy? 56. What did you say? 66. 56. 56. 56. Thanks, Billy. Here's a picture of our caves. And I'm going quick here because we have a wonderful video that we need to show. Um, our, our caves, real quickly, is, is about 60,000 square feet in size. It is like a small Walmart. Uh, if you in California, when the world comes to end, make your way to Brasfield. And you'll um, be safe. You'll be safe. <laughs> we have a lot of wine to drink. Yeah, we, we are, right? Yeah. All right. So this is going to bring you guys there virtually. Hopefully that enticed everyone to come out for a visit. Yeah, sometimes sometimes those don't always translate as well as we hope in some of the stores. I know having run one of the stores for a period of time, sometimes the, the sound doesn't go through. So we might send that as a link out or we'll definitely put it um, you know, okay. out there on our Facebook for everybody to see as well. Um, any other questions? Do we have questions from the crowd, from the stores, from the store owners? Last chance. Last chance. Yeah, it's definitely worth coming out and, um, you know, to see us if you're ever out in California. Uh, it's definitely a change of pace from Napa and Sonoma. Um, just a couple call outs if you want a place to look. The Tallman Hotel is extremely nice. It's in Upper Lake. Um, it's anti, it's it's an antique type uh, hotel that came in and redone. It's fantastic. There's a restaurant right next to that. Um, that would be my recommendation. There is also a number of uh, B and Bs in downtown Kelseyville that are I would recommend. And there's another nice restaurant, Kelseyville, uh, to service uh, they also. Um, so yeah. 
I'll tell you what, I mean, a lot of these places, you know, so many, so many people get so um, set, I would say, I'm going to Napa, right? Hey, I'm going to go to wine, wine, wine region and, and sort of being able to visit some of these off the beaten path places that aren't overly commercialized, that you pay a bazillion dollars for a tasting fee and, you know, get small samples um you know going to places like this will make you appreciate what napa used to be and hopefully what some of these places don't inevitably, inevitably become as well um and have that more hands-on hands-on experience you know the other thing that i think you mentioned which is great um is we often we often sort of struggle with identifying the wines that we want to highlight and feature for these tasting events because inevitably you guys make a lot more things than just what we tasted and going out, seeing the winery um, and tasting some of the winery only things, as well as other things that might be in production or available to us, you know, enhances in, uh, the experience and shows the full breadth of what you guys are capable of, um, you know, in that unique region as well. Um, you no, know, I definitely appreciate this. I know it's been um, a great tasting event. I, I appreciate Rose for kind of taking the horns and making this happen and, and, and sharing the wines and experience with us. And you you both um, also for taking your time um, you know, to share the wines with us and tell us about the story and the history and, and, and certainly the philosophy behind the wine making wines themselves as well. Yeah. And, you know, I appreciate for, I appreciate doing this. This is fantastic. Uh, you know, I wish I could be to all the stores to talk to everyone because I'm sure there's more questions and talk and drink the wine with you guys. Uh, so thank you for coming and experiencing this. Um, you know, I, I'll do another little plug for Lake County is I recently went down to Paso to taste and it's amazing how expensive it is to taste down there in Napa. I went to a, a winery that I know very well and their tastings are now $75 a person, which is just, you know, just insane. And for us, it's $20 a person and we'll waive it if you buy two bottles of wine, which is pretty easy to do, you know, so, uh, and um, like I said, I'm originally from Texas. I moved out here, 11 stoplights in the county. It is easy to get to. It is a fun place to come visit. Um, so I hope to see you guys and, and I hope you guys uh, go home with uh, a couple cases of wine also. So. <laughs> Not bottles, cases. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'd like to thank you all too for coming out on, uh, you know, in the middle of the week in January here in the Midwest. We, you know, although it's been kind of warm here, so that's kind of crazy, but um, I appreciate everyone who came to attend and, and took the time to listen to us and to, um, you know, drink and, and learn a little bit more about, you know, who and what and where we are at Brassfield. So, Thank you. And hopefully you all enjoyed the presentation and all of the wines. Perfect. Uh, one last thing. Uh, stay tuned. We will be announcing our February winery spotlight here very shortly. Um, we will continue with the series. Um, and in fact, we should have the entire yearly series done here by the end of the month um, and be able to share sort of so you can plan ahead, um, hopefully. But the February one will be released very soon. Um, uh, another wonderful winery out of California uh, with a great vision, great history as well. Um, and I believe it's 100 percent of state as well. So um, with no further with with that, we will sign off. Um, hope to see you guys soon in the stores. And and with that, goodbye. Thank you.